record. I think we're good. Looks good. All right. Um, bunk beds. So this bunk bed is just duplicated out. Um, this will start as one model. This is the same workflow I was doing last week where I just took something and I broke it apart. In this case, there's four posts. And I ended up putting the pivot at the base so that they could rotate down. And then we have three parts to the bed. So should I go through how I assembled this bunk bed? Or I guess better yet, how I took one model, broke it up into several. It was in the video last week. So how I placed pivots at the bottom here so that they could just rotate on the bottom. I'm just going to go through animation and then you let me know if you mean not to break up models. But once you break it up and, uh, and um, put it under a game object and, and call it something, so now it's all, it can be moved all together as one, scaled, rotated, whatever. The next stage is to create an animator and a series of animations and then create parameters and transitions for those animations and then you need to somehow initiate those parameters so whether it's through user input or trigger colliders or timers or what have you so um, if I create an animation folder you can right click create and you have to start off with an animator it's your state machine controller each animation is basically a state to go between so once you create it, you name it something. So I called it bunk bed. I usually name my animators something similar to the object. And then just drag it onto the object in the hierarchy. What happens is, is you have a, the animator connected to the game object. And so always connect the animator at the root. And then you have access to animating all the children underneath. So what can you animate? Normally, you animate the transforms, position, rotation, scaling information, but you can turn parts on and off. So if you want legs or parts of it to turn on and off, disappear or appear, you can do stuff like that. You can change materials and colors on them pretty quickly. Um, but I'm following just a, a standard workflow of, I guess you could call it like hard surface animation, where we're just doing transforms. We're doing position, rotation, scaling changes. Um, so let me pull this down here. This is what my bunk bed ended up looking like. So how did I get there? So first off, I got to open up the animation window. And click on one of these bunk beds. And since I've already created the animations, you see I have them here. So I'll just go forward and, and create them again, and then just reconnect them over here. Um, or you know what? Let me just create a whole new animation, whole new animator. So I'll just call it uh, Bunk Bed 2 And I'm just going to drag it onto this bunk bed. So we have a whole new animator. It's brand new. There's no states in there right now. It's empty. Go over to Animation. See, there's no animator animations to even play through here. Everything's grayed out. Click Create. Go into your animation folder. And normally I call it whatever the name of the animator is. In this case, Punk Bed 2 And whatever the name of the animation. So I'll call it Idle. So usually I'll just have this empty state. There'll be no animation, no data. It's just meant like this is the starting point of this object. It's already assembled into its default state, its idle state. So there's no animation needed to. It's just kind of like a remember this state because I'm going to go back to it later. So once I at least created idle, go over to animator. You see that we have our, our first state. This is our entry point when we click play. And if this animator is active, we go through this entry point, this transition, and we go into our first state. This happens to be idle. doesn't do anything. That's great. It doesn't do something until I tell it to do something. Go back to animation. Create a new animation. Create a new clip. 
I got bunk bed 02. I'm just going to click on it again so I don't have to like type everything out as much. And then next animation. So I called it wobble uh, or destable. The idea we're saying is, oh, maybe an earthquake is hitting. Maybe you, you're, you're, um, there's like an earthquake event about to happen and you have to run around and turn on the generators to like stabilize the base or something. So maybe these bunk beds are like constant, go, enter into this constantly wobbling state to show you that, you know, things are getting chaotic and you have to try and fix something. So I just did like, a, I, I called it wobble, but you call it something that makes sense to whatever the action is you're, you're doing. Um, and I showed you two ways of animating. One is you can click add properties and notice that all the components of that root, that parent object is available to you. In this case, I only have the transform. Um, but all the children are available. So we got four posts, so we got that top, mid, and bottom bunk. And if you open up either of them, you have access to their components. So normally you're going to jump into the transform and add one of these position rotation scaling information. But then I showed you a quick hand way of, um, okay, this, this record button helps speed up the workflow a lot. I don't have to go through and click add property on every single thing I wish to animate. Just move off time zero. So in this case, I'm just going to go 30 frames in, 60 frames a second. So that's half a second in. Animations default to one second, but you can make them shorter, longer, what you ever care to. Um, but the, the trick with this is just move off zero point, click record, and I'm going to grab something. So let's say, okay, the top bunk, oh, this is the wobble. So I was doing like rotation information. So let's say it goes to this left side a little bit. I'm just rotating it. And notice uh, this turned red. There's these diamonds drop down. They're called the keyframes. They recorded this different rotation information at this time a half a second in. So it looks like I just rotated about 15 degrees on the X. And I can play through it. And the, and the reason to bounce off of time zero is that now they put a little diamond or a keyframe at time zero. So it remembered that initial state. I don't need to go there and set it myself. I'm trying to remove work off of me. So now it says, oh, yeah, the bed was at uh, rotation zero, zero, zero at time zero. And I wish to change it just 15 degrees on the X over half a second. And I can click play and it'll loop and show it to me. So that's good. Maybe uh, maybe it goes a little bit to the left, and then maybe I move out a second more, and maybe move it a little to the right. And uh, oops, go back to my animation window, click play. So that's good um, speed-wise, but notice there's like a hiccup. There's like a, a, a disruption in my nice flowy animation. So that's because my start position and my end position are not the same. And so we go from end and we instantly pop to the beginning and there's a pop. So to, just for a very easy way to deal with that, you can always just copy and then move off um, later on wherever you want to end the time. Maybe a, maybe half, a, maybe a second in a, in a third or wherever and just paste it, control V. And these keys are just little records of information. You just copy and paste them wherever you want. You just select one, it turns blue, move to another point in time, and press Control-V. So now you notice there's not a pop in it, um, but it does have like this kind of like hold. So first off, you, you can move stuff around, and if it's too slow or too quick, if it's too slow, make the diamonds closer. That means less time between value changes. If it's too fast, move the diamonds more apart from each other. That means more time to get from your start to your end position. Or change um, and now let's say okay the whole length of the animation and what's happening is really good this makes a lot of sense to me um, I can open up this arrow and look at oh this really rotation really has three value changes it's just Y and Z aren't doing anything that's fine but I can go and look into the next level deeper of the animation information if it's got this little hiccup going so we got the dope sheet which shows you just the general keys the general change information that you've recorded as the animator and if you go into curves press the f key 
here's what the animation looks like. And if you zoom out, notice it's cyclical. It goes off into infinity if you want your animation to loop. Sometimes you don't. You just want it to play once. In this case, I'm, I'm having it just loop and play until another event happens. Um, but the point being, if I zoom out, notice how we have our min and our max. And it looks like one side of the slope, one side of the mountain is nice and flat, but the other side has this kind of little mid-valley. And this is where this hiccup or this, this pause is happening right there. So sometimes you have to be wary of this. So if I click on rotate Y, rotate Z, you notice it's dead. Um, it's flat. Those keys really don't need to exist. If you wish to, you can delete them. Um, so we go up and then we go down. And then we have some issue here we need to fix. So as I click on these little points, these are the keys. As I click on them, they get this little handle sticking out here. These are very similar to, to Bezier curves and... Um, vector illustrations. So when you can pull on these handles to change how the interpolation, the, the curve is drawn between these major points. So they're called keys because um, these are the values that you set. I want the value to be here at this time. And then the computer figures out how to interpolate the value between the start and the end, or value one and value two, or wherever you are in the curve of by default, everything's got this curviness to it. It's called these auto curves. Um, and most of the time, they work really well. They give you this nice ease in out, this momentum. But sometimes they, they cause issues like this. And you don't want this nice curved interpolation. You want a flat or a linear interpolation. Just wherever I am and wherever I need to go over a certain amount of time, divide that time up into these frames. We have 60 frames a second. And give me a straight up division of dividing out the units that we need to get to. So if I take this handle and just lower it down and line it up with the curve, um, notice, oh, let me let me bring it back and I'll zoom out and you see this repeated curve. If I pull it down, notice it kind of flattens out one part of the curve. We're, we're almost there, but I need to go to where the other point connects, the start point, and drag his handle up to align with the curve. And notice now we've kind of gotten rid of that, that um, messy part of the curve, or that hold, that mid-valley, I should say. So as I play it, now we don't have that hold. So sometimes you want it, sometimes you don't. It's just know that once you drop down your keys, what you're really trying to do is get like a macro closeness to what you're trying to get to. The speed feels right. The general motion feels right. But... Um, there may be pops, hiccups, holds, stuff that doesn't feel right to you. And then normally you have to jump into the curves and mess with these little tangent handles to try and get what you want. So, uh, sure, let's say top bunk looks good. Um, and let me select these keys, press the F key to, to zoom up on them. Um, so you can click on keys and, and move them left right to redo your, your timing of your animation. You can probably see it more in, in curves here that see how it, it's actually changing the curve. I'm just going left to right. You can actually hold the shift key, not change the value up and down. I'm just changing the location on the timeline of the value. And it has a very drastic effect if I do this. It has a big overall effect on the animation because the timing is just different. <clears throat> uh, if I go back to Dope Sheet, the other thing you can do is um, if you click at the, you can click on each of these individually. If so, happen they have different animation data and move them, or you can move them as a group if you select their top part. So, for example, just all rotation, I want to move it. Um, you can also select all your little diamonds and you have this little line here and you can scale them down meaning speed up the animation or you can scale them out to slow it down so there's a lot of changes you could do quickly to try and find what, what it is that you, you want um, the next thing let's add another object so I'll click on this mid mid bed 
here. Click on the right one. Looks like I jumped out of my animation. I'll jump back in, click the record button, jump to mid bed. So let's see if the top bed's going this way. Maybe mid bed goes that way. I don't know. Just trying to figure out something that's interesting. And then I need to copy and paste that last key so that we have a, uh, our start and ending is the same. For some reason, I brought the position in. I don't remember changing that. I'm just going to remove that for right now. I just have my two rotations, mid and top. So it looks like mid has got that little hiccup. So now we're getting more curves. It might be more complicated to look at. I'm just going to click on my mid curve. And even within that, just my X and my mid so that I don't see all these other curves. And I'm just going to go and clean up that little hiccup part. And click play. And maybe for the bottom, let me see if I could just take the top. I'm just going to copy it and I'm going to click on the bottom. Let's see if I can paste it in. Now it looks like. For the bottom, I just have to move it a little bit just so it gets registered in here. And let's just say I want to take the top animation. I can click the bottom, paste it in. Looks like a, I'm going to do that. Looks like your timeline needs to be at the beginning. Do that. Get rid of this position thing. Click paste. And now the bottom is moving with the top. So I quickly am reusing animation information. Um, so let's say I, I'm happy with the wobble and I do want this to just constantly loop like this because I don't know when the ending of this event happens because I'm syncing it up with other parts of the level or some type of interactive. So let's say I'm good with this. So I'm going un to unclick record. I'm done with the animation. And here's my wobble. So any questions? I need to not loop again. Not loop. Yeah. So the file. So this is the icon for an animator. This is the icon for an animation. And on that animation here, we have loop time. So if you don't want to loop, which I'll get to, um, I'm going to build the sequence of events in the animator and I'll turn off what should loop and shouldn't loop. But if you don't want it, you got to turn off that loop time there. It's on by default because most game animations are looping. All right, so next, I'm going to click on a previous animation to harvest some of its naming conventions, and then I call it, um, what is it, collapse? Sure, I'll call it collapse. And I'm do the same thing. I'm going to hit the record button, move off times zero. And I think what I did is I just said, okay, top bunk falls first. At some point in time, he's going to fall down. He'll hit the mid bunk, then the top and the mid later on, they'll both fall, hit the bottom, and then some point later on, all three of them will just fall to the ground. So I don't care about the timing right now, but I'm just clicking play to see what issues I have. So it looks like the mid and the bottom bunk start moving with the top bunk. I don't want that. I want this to be a, a sequence of events. So really, top bunk should be moving first. Mid bunk, I'm going to move off its start point till the two of them hit. Bottom bunk, I'm going to move off its start point to where they all land on the bottom bunk. So top bunk hits, mid bunk, bottom bunk. If I want to do like a brief hold, notice how they hit each other and they all instantly just kind of fall down on themselves. If you wanted to do like a little bit of a hold, you could do something like, okay, we hit the mid bunk here. So I'm going to take these keys, copy, move them off of a few frames, paste. So there's like a few frame hold. So notice now top hits mid, they hold for brief, and then they all fall. So just show you that you can copy and paste keys really quickly if you want little holding parts or, or what have you. So let's look at the timing of all this. Let's say um, looks pretty good but I guess maybe um, it's a slow state of execution it doesn't feel like it's like 
heavy mass falling on top of themselves. So this is where you could just take all the keys and you have this little bar here and you could shrink stuff down. You could even take little sections and move them around. Maybe this whole event happens every 15th or a quarter of a second. And that looks something like that. Maybe it speeds up. Maybe it's like 15 frames. There's a little hold and then that real momentum hits. Maybe it's like less, maybe 10 frames and then even more weight. So it's even quicker toward the end. And so all that weight just speeds up less time because they're just breaking quicker. So it's like too fast. I can't even really see what's going on. So just pop them open a few more frames. And then say, okay, this is great. Love it. Now let's have like the posts falling over. So I'll move off time zero, move to the posts. And let's see, go to pivot mode. I purposely built the posts. So this is an empty group that's sitting right at the base of the post. So the post itself, its pivot point, its center point is centered up on the geo, which sometimes it's really useful. In this case, I want to animate the posts at their base. So I actually just made an empty game object, moved it all the way to the bottom of the base, and just dragged in the actual post geometry underneath it, made it a child. So what can I do with that? Well, maybe I can... Um, I'll do a little wobble, move it a little randomly this way, that way, this way. And then when the whole thing falls down, maybe just it falls down as well. So maybe it does something like that. Huh? A little fast. At the end? Yeah. Yeah, so I can open it up. Say that's too fast. Maybe I'll take this post pivot and just pop it off. Maybe another 15 frames. It does something like that. Yeah. Maybe if that's too fast, I'll just keep moving it out. Yeah, and see how fa easy it is to kind of tweak, move stuff, these little keys back and forth, and figure out what your time that you're happy with. So maybe I really like this rotation on this post one, and I don't really want to go through all the work of doing the other posts. So all I got to do is just... Um, Rotate the little post a little bit just so it kind of like appears as a property that I'm supposed to use. Then I did all that. I'm just kind of going to delete that, that key. I'm going to select all this information. I'm going to select these guys. I think I, I can paste. Nope, only one at a time. So I'm just going to go through and I pasted them all up. And I do something like that to say, okay, maybe I don't want them all falling to the same position. Maybe this one should be like over there. This one should be maybe over there. This one should be like over there. That looks like a person split up. But cool. So I'm just trying to reuse my animation. Sometimes if it's not reusable, I'll change it. Since maybe they all kind of moving at the same time, maybe I'll just kind of offset these a little bit so that they don't look like they're just mere copies of themselves, even though they, they all have the same information. And even though that's all the same information, I just moved the little keys off by a frame or two, and they look all unique. So let's say I'm done. I did all my animations for my bunk bed. Undo, record. If I pop out, back into my animator. I got my idle, got my wobble, my collapse. I got to start linking them up. So right click on one animation, state, make transition, go to where you wish to go to. So idle to wobble, right click, make transition. We're going to go to collapse and then collapse back to idle. So I'm setting up my initial transitions. Now I got to set up my parameters over here. This parameter tab is clicked on. I don't have any. These are very similar, probably the exact same as like a public variable in a C sharp state um, script. But yeah, float int pool trigger. You can grab these and change them through other scripts. So they are just like publicly accessible variables. 
So in real complicated uh, player controllers, like character controllers, you might actually be reading in like the velocity that the character is currently at to see if it should go from like walk to run, this and that. But we're just going to use simple stuff like either ints, pools, or triggers. Triggers are like a simplified version of a bool where it's either set and it's you can either set it and it just kind of pops back. So if you want to just use it to move from different states, sometimes a trigger is useful. But I try to stick to um, ints because they're easy for everyone to understand and use. So I just said create an int and now call it something. So in this case, um, usually I'll call it like state or maybe state change or something. Some name that is useful. So it starts at zero. So you can think of these as elements on a list different states that we have to give numbers to. So you can just kind of arbitrarily say, okay, this is my starting point. So that's just going to be my state zero. This is my first animation I go to. So this is like my state one. Here's my last animation, my state two. So we're going to transition between them by changing this integer from zero, one, and two. So I click on my transition and transitions uh, by default have exit times. They're just, they just they run through the animation and just um, whenever it's done, it moves on to the next one. So if I were to click play, where's my game view? Um, let me hide my player controller. Let me just turn on my main camera. And let me move the camera over to here. And, I, and this is the special bunk bed. This is the one I just um, changed the animator on. But if you notice, um, it's playing wobble, it falls, and then it's repeating. So actually, let me get out of maximized view. It's not what I want. All right, so if I click on the animator for it, notice the blue lines. Notice it's just cycling through the animations. Whenever the animation is done, it moves on to the next animation. There's nothing really interactive about it. It's like a linear flow of time. And notice there's a blue bar filling up each state. And as that bar is done, notice that the transition line highlights and we move on to the next animation. So this is all time-based transitions. Or when I click on this transition, what's called this has exit time. So I'm going to turn this off. Now my conditions, I add. And since I only have one type of parameter, that's the only one you can select from. And just say whenever state change equals, and we're going from state 0 to state 1. So I'm going to say whenever state change equals 1, I want to move on to the next animation. This one's going from state 1 to 2. Turn off exit time, add a condition, say whenever state change equals 2, we're going to go from state 1 to 2. Then I'm going to click on this transition, turn off exit time, add a condition, and this is when state change equals 0. We're going back to state 0. So now I've went through, I've set up all my transitions. I have a parameter that's governing these transitions. And so I'll click play again. And I'm going to go to the animator. And here we are in idle, and it's just sticking there. It's not going anywhere. But I can test here. I can go click on my parameter, and I'll change it to 1. And it's moved to wobble. And wobble is a loopable animation. So it's just constantly playing over and over again until we leave this state. Then I can change it to 2, and now it's in collapse mode. And collapse mode is looping, which is I don't want that. So now I found another issue in my animator system, which means I have to go to the animation file and turn off loop time on collapse. It's only to be played once. All right. Let's go back into play mode. 
Back in my animator, we're in idle. I'm going to switch to state to one. Here's looping. It's or here's wobble. It's looping. We're good to go. And at some point, something happens. The earthquake eventually hits. The generator runs out of power or something. I can press two. It collapses and then it stays in the end of the collapse state. And it's just sitting there, and then I can, you know, if you want to reset it, you press the zero key, and then we can start the cycle over again. So now I'm going to create a, a script to control that. But before I do, is there any questions on the animation states, the transitions, and the parameters that govern the transitions? All right. So I've made use pretty exclusively of the animator window, the animation window. And um, in this case, I can say I have completed my animations for my bunk bed animator. And I can go ahead and create the, the controls are connected up to the game level or the game you know, mechanics or whatever you're doing. Um, So let me just double check that the other bunk beds. I'm just going to put its original animator back on it just to make sure that it syncs up because I already had the script created, but nothing else has changed for me. So I'm going to turn off the camera. I'm going to turn on the first person controller. This is from um, Standard Assets. There's nothing crazy about it. It's the prefab as is. The only thing that's new down here is I have this animation manager script. So to create a script, I don't even know if I have a scripts folder. No, I just create it through here. You just right click, create C sharp script. And in this case, I just called it animation manager or, or um, user input or whatever that makes sense to you. But here's mine down here. Okay. So in these, um, for these bunk beds, I, I duplicated them out, and I have six of them. Um, so I ended up going with an array to, to capture them all as a collection to set their animators. But if you have just one, um, I, which I think I do, yeah, I do later on with the door over here. So in this case, I have I want to mess around with like six animators at once, six bunk beds. So in my script, I say public animator. This little symbol means an array or a collection of animators, and I'm going to call them bunk beds. So you could do a collection of our, an array of game objects, but then you'll have to go through and say get component on the animators on each game object to find its animator component. So this is just, a, just say grab the animators. It just makes it one step closer or easier. Once you do that and save it, you'll have this bunk beds array it'll be at size zero these won't be connected but if you just change it to six or however many i just had the seventh just now and i'm just going to empty it out actually i'll just do size zero it looks like this and i do six and then it looks like this i've got six elements they're all empty they're not connected to anything it says none and then Here's my six animators, six bunk beds. I'm just going to connect them up. Say these are the animators I wish to control with my script. And um, this update loop comes with the script. So in it, I just have three if checks. Um, and then we have some input statements here. So this is coming from the uni engine class it just gives us quick access to keyboard input so you, you can just uh, write this down input dot get key down and then you can write down any key that you wish to press or get mouse down if you want to do a mouse click but this says get key down and then in parentheses there you have key code and if i remove this you'd see you have all the keys on your keyboard mapped out here. So in this case, I'm just going alpha zero, which is the numbers above your, your, um, your key area, your alpha alphabet keys. And I'm saying if I press zero, 
one or two, I'm going to do something. So this is how I'm just mapping it to the keys. So what am I doing if I press zero, one, or two? In this case, I am going through a for each loop. So since I have a, an array of six elements, to a really easy way to loop through them is a for each loop. I don't need to do any um, like iterators or do more manual stuff for a for loop. I just say for each. Then I can say animator, give it a name. In this in this case, I'm just giving a name of bunk bed anim in bunk beds. So for each individual element that we move through this for each loop, which happens to be just an array of six animators, I'm just calling them bunk bed anim. I'm going to do something. So bunk bed anim is an animator, six of them in fact, that we're referencing. And these animators exist on those game objects I just created, the bunk beds. And they have access to some methods. They have set bool, set trigger, set float, set integer. In this case, I created an integer parameter, so I'm going to say set integer. Then in the parentheses there, you give the actual name of the parameter in quotes. And then whatever the number you wish to set it to. So when I press 0, I wish to set state parameter to 0. When I press 1, I wish to set it to 1. And when I press 2, this I'll have to go over. I had two, I randomized two different animations that could be played on these six objects. But if you want to simplify it, I just comment that out and just say play 2. And then I'll, I'll show you the next step with this randomization, why we did this. But if I press 0, 1, or 2, it's going to set that integer to 0, 1, or 2. And the rest I can, I'm not ready yet. So if I click play, if I press the 1 key, they all go into their, their wobble animation. It's looping. Uh, the two key, they all collapse. Zero key, go back to setting. So one key centers into this continuous wobble animation until something else is hit, some triggers stepped on or whatever, a lever is pressed. And then the two key, they go into their collapse and just sits there until you want to reset also. All right? What happens if you hold down the zero and one? So this is why I set... Um, it depends which animation state they're in. So that's why I specifically said only zero goes from this state to this state, one to this, two to that. So if you press zero and one at the same time, you're pressing, you're setting it, you're, you, you're not going to press them simultaneously at the exact same. One's going to go a little bit before the other. So it's going to be like zero, then set to one forever. Or if you hit one, then zero. It'll be one really quickly, and then set the integer to zero. But in this case, I can spam 1 and 0, and it doesn't do anything until I, I hit the 2 key, because I purposely set the 2 key to transition out of state 1. So here I can spam 1 and 2, it's not going to do anything until I hit 0. So yeah, if, um, if I set up a different, the triggers in a different way, you might get something like this, where it's, you're, you're constantly coming back and forth back. I purposely set it to 1, 2, and 0. All right. So next, I have created this cube, game object, 3D object, cube. It doesn't really matter. It can be cubes, spheres. You can, but the point is that you scale it up and you position it where you care to have either the player or an NPC or some object that either moves into the volume, stays in the volume, or exits the volume. So in this case, I'm only tracking when I enter and exit. But when you create a uh, 3D primitive, not only does it have a render on it, but it has a collider. But notice that the collider, you can make it a trigger or not. 
So a, um, a collider, so the player controller is going to have a collider on it. If a collider touches another collider, they're going to they're going to hit into each other. But if a collider touches a trigger, the collider is allowed to enter the trigger volume unopposed, but it does send out events for us to record or be aware of. So all I did was create a, a 3D primitive, in this case a cube, and I scaled it up to wherever I wish that the player enter and exit it. And I, I changed the uh, render on it. So I just made a new material. I made it transparent and I just lowered the alpha on the color so I can see where the volume is, but it's not like blocking what's inside of it. So you don't have to, in this situation, you don't have to be worried the floor yet. So all, you, all I have is a first person controller. That controller has a rigid body and a collider on it already. That's all done for you. Um, actually, for, I'm sorry, for him to walk around, you are going to need a floor. So I just created a plane. On top of it having a, a collider, I, later on I added this rigid body to it to deal with this tombstone that's going to explode onto it. But there is a floor that has a collider, so the player can walk on it. And I, then I created this cube. I just called it trigger volume, and I made the collider a trigger. I turned on this check bar, uh, mark and just added a semi-transparent shader on it. And I can go back to my script. And what do I have here? On trigger enter, um, I only know that the player is walking around. So I don't need to. You can do other checks, like what is this other object that just came in? What's the name of it? What's the tag on it? What type of you know components are on it? Whatever. But um, I know that whenever this on trigger enter happens, now this is on the player. This script is on the player, and when the collider enters into an, another trigger volume, this method will be called on the collider, so in this case, the player. And all I'm doing is I have a static tombstone and a dynamic one. I have two game objects. I'm turning one off and one on. So they're up here. I'm going to show you how I made them in a second. But I just have one on, which he just sits there. He's the static tombstone. And underneath him are sitting on top of him, I should say. Let me show you the hierarchy. So this one's on. This one's off, that light gray. When I enter the volume, they swap. And the one that just turned on became active has a bunch of colliders on all these parts of the tombstone. And they have gravity acting on, they all have rigid bodies, they all fall onto each other, and they have this kind of bouncing off effect. Now you can make the me any mesh you want. This one was just, I grabbed it from Shoreforge here. So if I turn the plane off, I'm, I'm back in this, um, I'm still in the texturing window, right? So if you remember, I made this, this tombstone and, and Shoreforge. Um, there was that button over there. I, I, I kind of broke this scene. I'll, I'll show you a short forge later on if you want to know how to, how to, um, but there's that one, the tab all the way to the left has like three tools. One's a decal, one's like a, a damage and one's like a, a slicer upper. And so I just created the top part of this tombstone and used the slicing tool on it. And it kind of divided it up into these sections. So this is how I got an object that was kind of sliced up, ready for a physics simulation. Normally use a type of 3D package like a Blender or Maya, and there's like tools that will like randomly chop up. A, it's very similar to this. But I just kind of used Shoreforge in this way. So all I did was I found these chopped up parts of the tombstone. I'm just clicking on them all right now. All right, I found everything.
and I'm just going to copy and paste it. It's just Control D, and I just moved it out of the hierarchy. There's a lot of objects in this SureForge scene, but I just pulled that out, and I just moved it over. Cool. So once I did that, um, they all have this poly lasso object on it, this script, this component. I just removed that, and since I have them all selected, I just removed it from all of them. And... I just did a uh, create an empty game object. I turned off, I turned off all the SureForge stuff. I turned this root off. Here's an empty game object. I'll pop it up here. I'm just gonna position it like kind of at the base. I can even go into top down without perspective isometric. And I just kind of po positioned it right at the base of it. Then call that tombstone or what have you and took all these objects dragged them under it I can get out of top-down mode and all I did was kind of scale it and flip it up 90 degrees yeah and just scaled it down Brought it over. I can turn my floor plane back on. And just scaled it, positioned it. So, next thing. Um, the back is empty. This is the way SureForge objects work. So I just um, kind of just took this whole object and just duplicated it. And just flipped it around. It's like 180 on the Z. And just position them on top of each other. That's about it. That's how I kind of assembled this object. And um, looks like I need to create an empty game object and just center it up. All right, and then I can group the two underneath that. All right, so now it's a whole collection of meshes all under one game object, and they all have their colliders on it. I think the only thing I'd do is that all the colliders needed, I just select them all, they all had to be turned convex, if I remember correctly. Yeah, they all have a rigid body, use gravities turned on, and mesh colliders made convex. So I just kept messing around until I made it work. So you can select them all, make their colliders convex, add a rigid body, make sure a rigid body has gravity turned on. And that's it. We're good to go. You can assign your own materials or what have you. But that's how I built the tombstone that's dynamic. Then I just duplicated it and I selected all the parts of it and I just removed I just removed the rigid bodies. I removed all the mesh colliders. And then that's how I got the static version of it. So I, I just turned off the mesh collider on this one. Alright. So I have one instance of this tombstone all broken up. Um, and you actually usually the one that's stationary isn't all chopped up already. Usually it's the mesh before it got gets chopped up. But in any case, one's at static, one that's dynamic, two objects. The dynamic one I'm just going to turn off. And then the floor, it seems like I had to add turn on rigid body and I turned on is kinematic on the floor. And the two objects were able to interact with each other. So once I did all that, see I have here public game object, static and dynamic tombstone. So these are not arrays. These are just individual variables that are references to game objects. Once I save that out onto the first person controller down here, I just drag them on. One static, one's the dynamic. 
So now I'm aware of these objects. I'm aware when I enter this trigger volume. All I do is turn the static one false, turn it off, set active false, and turn the dynamic one on, set active true. And that's why when I enter into this region, we can play the dynamic one, which has physics on it. Our animates based on the physics system and explodes and falls over. All right. Any questions on setting that up? If you choose to want to have this type of physics explosion, you can kind of use Shoreforge to get that process going. And now the last part. When you exit, this trigger volume, the door opens up. All right. So on trigger exit, it has to know about the door. So in this case, I was a little lazy. I already had these public game objects here. So I just added a third one, door. And since it's a game object reference, I have to say door dot get component animator set trigger in this case i'm using a trigger and i'm calling it open so let me go through how i built the door and created the animation for it set the transition created this trigger and now i can open up a door when i get a certain distance from it or something so the other thing um actually after i do that let me show you um on trigger stay Yeah, and then I'll do a check. I'll say, um, I'll do an E key. So press E to um, open the door. I'll show you that you can now, if you're close enough to something, here's something else. Here's, okay, you know, you're interacting. If you're close enough to a chest and you press the E key, the, the chest will open up. So I'll show you that after that. So the door. All right, so I just built it with a bunch of cubes. So all I did was game object, 3D cube. I mean, you can go through and you'll, you'll it's just a part of your level you built with Umodeler or Pro Builder. But all I did was create one part of the wall, duplicate it out, moved it over, then duplicate it out and said, okay, here's, I think I did two, three parts to the door. So this part, I shrunk down, I scaled it in a little bit, made it a little bit longer. This was the top part. When I duplicate it, here's the bottom part. And then duplicate again and shrink it for the middle part. All right. I'm going to call this um, mid. Bottom, top, here I got one wall, here I got another wall. I'm going to create an empty game object, position it kind of where the door is, call that door, put the parts of the door within it. And actually, I'm going to move this whole chunk of wall. I'm just going to create another empty game object, position it, call it wall chunk, take all this stuff. I'm going to move it in here. And then I'm just going to move the wall chunk because this one I'm going to activate by pressing the E key. So I'll move it over here, get it pretty close to the trigger volume because this is, um, you know what? I'm actually going to put it in the trigger volume. You have to open this door first. You have to be within the trigger volume. Press the E key to get through this door before you get to the next one.
All right, that'll work. So now I've got this door component, a uh, game object. I gotta go in, create an animation for it. Call it, I call it door02, because I already have a door animator. Put on my door, go to the animator, it's empty. Go to animation, create new. Jump into my animation folder. This is called Doro2, just called an idle. This is just a state that it starts in. Create a new one, Doro2, open. All right, hit the record button, move out in time. And uh, I'm going to go select the objects within here. Maybe this one. I think I just had this one go to one side. I had the bottom go to another. Oh, I don't have record for some reason. Let me go over to open, hit record. I step back. There we go. Top is back to where it should have been. Move it. Bottom, move that one. And then the mid one, I just rotated it 90 degrees. All right, now play it. Looks a little fast. I'll just scale it out some. There we are. That looks good. I'm done with my animation. Turn off the render or the uh, record mode. Now I got my two animations. I got my idle one, which already connects to my entry point. And I just want to transition to open. And yes, open should not be looping. So I'm going to click on the animation file. I'm going to turn it off. You should play once and just stick. And um, I'm going to click on the parameters. And uh, in this case, I just did a trigger. So a trigger just executes. Um, but you know what? Let me, let me do a, a bool and I'll open and close it. Sure. Let me do a bool this time. And call it um, is open. So boy, you have to set the true false. So if we're going from idle to open, we're not doing it on has exit time. We're gonna add a condition. We're gonna say is open is true. Then we create another transition back to idle. Turn off have exit time. Say condition is open is false. Now I can go back and forth in this animation this animator and now my script needs to know about Doro 2 save it let it compile so that it's now asking me for Doro 2 there it is drag it on all right so if we are um, So this on trigger exit, this is calling the first door. So this has a trigger. Now I'm going to set up this second door. So I have to be within the trigger volume, and I have to press um, the E key. So I'm just going to copy and paste this if statement. Throw it in here. And instead of alpha 0, I'm going to hunt. There's the E key. So if we're within this trigger volume and we press the E key, I'm going to say Doro2, get component, because we're only referencing the game object, not the animator component. And this is a set bool. So a set bool, I called it, is open. And then we have to say, what are we setting it true to? And it's going to be true. But... So I'm missing a bracket here. Right. I'm, I'm going to copy this, and when we leave the trigger volume, I'm also going to set that to false. See if the door closes behind us, and then the other door opens. All right, so I entered in my code, connected my code to my animator, built the parameters and transitions of my animator. I can click play. 
and uh, let's see, one, two, zero, bunk beds work, walk in, tombstone destroys, prime inside the volume, press the E key, my first door opens, leave the trigger volume opening this door, and if I turn around behind me, this door closes. And if I walk within the volume again, press the E key, the door opens. And if I leave, the door closes. So I think I covered most of your animation needs with the trigger volumes and the user input. I don't expect you to do the physics stuff. I thought it was just an interesting thing because Shore Forge, I just happened to already divide up this tombstone in Shore Forge, and I'm just like, oh, I can just grab it, run a physics simulation on it. But I can, open, I can run animations now. You can do anything. You can even see bunk beds have multiple instances of this same animator. You saw me open and close doors, and our, you can just do whatever object based on if they're in a trigger volume or not. The trick with that is that trigger volume, whatever this, you're not, it, they're always invisible, so you just basically do them with primitives, usually cubes. And the trick is that the collider needs to be a trigger. All right, so now you get some functionality, some, some interactivity to your levels. So our spread four is wrapping up all of your texturing. Everything should be textured. In fact, if you're not happy with stuff, go back and retexture it, but then state that. I'll count that as you know part of your spread four work. And then I asked you to do three animations, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Animate three props. All right, some props are going to have multiple animations on them. Some might have two. Some might just have one, but usually you have this idle, and then it goes into some animation. Sometimes something is just constantly animating. It just has one animation it's just running over and over again. Sometimes maybe they're popping back and forth between two animations or what have you. Um, finalize lighting. I mean, the, the trick with lighting is um, just make sure you're, you're baking – in light settings here, just making sure you're, you're generating your lighting and that, that in your WebGL should look exactly like what you're seeing in the editor. Um, and get some lighting solution going. Um, place your lights out, bake them out, try to get something interesting. You can, uh, some of you are already starting to animate, like the lights flickering. Some of you might have put some scripts on there for like random the intensity ramping up and down between zero and one or turning lights on when you enter a room, turning them off when you leave a room. That's the same as just turning my eyes did whatever the game object is dot set active true false. You could just turn lights on and off. You can even grab their intensity. You can actually put them right in as children objects within your animator and you can have access to all the lighting. You change the colors, you can change the intensities. Um, I, the only thing I've left to cover is Sketchfab then. So, um, I gotta come up with some stuff for next week. So, I, yeah, is there anything I haven't? that anyone's interested in that I should be aware of for next week. I can create a little thing on it. Is anyone stuck in um, shoreforge, UVing, breaking objects up for animation? Is there anything I should do tomorrow, or next week, I should say? Yep. Sorry, what was that? Animation for what lighting go? Like, um, for example, I can be using like light bulbs and then put basically turn on. Yeah, I can do that. So, animating, I can get show you some simple scripts for just making stuff flicker, and then I can, you want to see how lights are in the animation system? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
I can prep this up for next week. So I'll get a few animation by code um, samples. So random uh, fluctuations. Um, I can move stuff. Um, I could also just. Um, yeah, so I'll do like a patrolling. So you'll see like patrolling enemies or stuff that kind of moving around by different checkpoints. Lurping, yeah, I'll do lurping between checkpoints. Yeah, you want to you want to change lighting settings in the animator. Change lighting settings. In uh, animations. Is there anything else? So I'll go over Sketchfab. So I'm not going to do any modeling, UVing, texturing, or breaking models in part next. Um, could you go over like cloud? I mean, skybox animations, like stay roaming cloud. Okay. So, day night cycles and clouds. Yeah. Roam. So like clouds just randomly moving through the sky, constantly cycling like the weather's moving. Weather patterns, cloud movement. Okay. Yeah, I can find on that. All right. Anything else? Yeah. So that's a huge. Uh, I can I can show you some some tutorial videos. So their character modeling and animation is like the hardest because people are gonna nitpick the most out of it because they understand keyframes the most. So they um, in that level of like graphic quality, that artistic level, I don't I don't see here. But I'll, I'll find some videos. Any any in particular? Uh, no, just um, character, just character modeling and just yeah, just the basics. Sure. Uh, there was one thing I was looking into. I wanted to know. Um, how do you like better control lighting? Because once I used, I was trying to use spotlights to get a certain look, and once I went past three spotlights, nothing else would perform the same way. So I was like wondering, is there like a way to like bake lighting onto like existing textures? Yeah. So the whole bake lighting process, you're actually baking out like texture maps. Um, yeah, I really know nothing about that. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know that baking the lighting helps to you know speed up and optimize games. So finesse lighting. Hmm. Um, yeah, there's real time versus baked. Sure. Real time versus baked. Yeah. Um, man, like managing multiple light sources. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to put my lights as like one big three fab, and I couldn't get it to work. Sure. All right. Well, that's a pretty big list. So, is that it? All right.
So we have our, our, our topics for next week. Um, so I'm going to stop this video. So everyone's good? Everybody just went over. You just